It takes just about 90 seconds to drive through the A3 tunnel at Hindhead, a journey under the Devil's Punch Bowl through the longest land tunnel in the UK. It speeds traffic south to Portsmouth and north to London. And in a few moments underground, you'd never know what's gone into its design or how long it took to build. So why build it at all? At the moment, the A3 does nothing for Hindhead whatsoever apart from fill it with noise and pollution and make it actually quite a dangerous place to be. We're really hoping that by removing the A3 and working on a regeneration project that we will want to move here but also we will want to visit. What was causing the congestion was a crossroads in the centre of Hindhead Village. But why build a tunnel, surely the most complex and expensive option? The problem with the crossroads is that it's developed all around it, so it's very difficult to widen anything. Another reason was the environment. Hindhead is close to the Devil's Punch Bowl, a national trust area. An overland option would be very difficult to thread through those restricted areas. A tunnelled solution allows us to run right underneath them. It was in 2006 that the plan was given permission, around half a century after the traffic problems first arose. But cutting through a forested area like this meant special treatment for the wildlife. Especially important were reptiles and protected species like dormice. Balfour Beatty have had a very strong environmental team on the project since they even started building it. I've been very impressed with their focus on the environment. They've involved all the, you know, all the parties at the National Trust. We have to have a dormouse licence uh, in order to work around dormice. When we started clearing in January, dormice were hibernating, so we had to clear land in not more than 50 metre wide strips. They don't travel across the ground, they travel in the canopy of trees. We've had these dormice bridges built for them to get from tree to tree. There are also reptiles like uh, slow worms, uh, adders, lizards, and we put up special protective fencing and during the summer we collected them in these special areas and then transported them to the other side of the punch bowl where they now live happily. Once the area was cleared, the site was free for the arrival of heavy machinery. The tunnel would be 1.2 miles long. Together with the dual carriageways leading to and from it, the construction site stretched over four miles, meaning a lot of earth and rock to be bored, cut and moved. And the rock is sandstone, soft and relatively easy to lift, but not easy to build a tunnel through. Enter the geologists who were crucial to the project, especially when preparing for first tunnelling. Here we're looking for how much of the material is rock, how much of sand, any trends as you go down the place, so we know what we're going to come across when we tunnel into it. That determines how fast they can advance and what sort of support they have to put into the tunnel. We'll be logging the face for every metre advance that we do. Support was needed because sand doesn't like being vertical. Something has to stop it from collapsing. The answer? Soil nails. Soil nails are a metal rod. It's a threaded rod, essentially, that you drill a hole into the side of the rock that you've just excavated, put your soil nail in, and you grout that up to hold it into the rock. So you've got a threaded rod sticking out the side of your cut face, and then you put a, a mesh over to hold the rock back, uh, and then a, a big washer, essentially, I mean, it's, it's big, <laughs> and then a nut on top. Tighten that up, and that holds the face up against the nails. The whole surface is then stabilised by spraying on a concrete mix known as shockcrete. Typically, they drill uh, perhaps 25, 30 nails per day, 8 to 10 metres in length, and the shockcrete is applied shortly following that. It would take six months of soil nailing, shockcreting and site preparation before everything was ready for tunnelling to begin. In the meantime, there was work going on elsewhere, like improvements to the rights of way that would lead to crossings over and under the new roads. Part of the development of the scheme was making sure that we took account of all the interest groups that use and cross the road. I've been riding this area for 24 years now, and it's a smashing area to ride. Over the years, the A3's got busier and busier. We knew they were going to do the bypass, and we thought, how are we going to get across? 
And we've had a number of underpasses that we've built on the scheme to accommodate them, to take them safely under the A3. The underpasses here were constructed using precast elements, which enabled very fast construction. We're actually standing on top of an underpass at the moment. So we had to dig the hole out to put the underpass in, and then we've compacted material around it and on top of it. I'm using a nuclear density gauge to test the compaction of this material to make sure it's at specified levels. Basically making sure the material we put on top of this underpass doesn't move. Just seeing the reaction of stakeholders like the British Horse Society and so on and Ramblers, they were really, really pleased. Well, I think they're doing a fantastic job, actually. It could have been absolutely impossible to get about, but now it's making it safer. And uh, the A3 isn't going to limit us now. That, I think, makes the day when you've actually done something that, you know, people are really pleased and happy about. As well as recreational crossings for walkers and riders, there were also to be three main road crossings, of which Hammer Lane was the most complex. Well, we're at Hammer Lane. This is a bridge which is going to take the dual carriageway, the new dual carriageway, and also a local road for the residents. It consists of 24 precast beams which sit on two abutment shelves. It's programmed over a period of four months from start to finish, which starts off with a piling operation to take the abutments, landing the beams, and then we excavate underneath the bridge while the guys on the top come and put the new road surface over the top. By 2008, the first scoops of sandstone marked the beginning of the tunnel's construction. The need to keep nailing and shockcreting the surface to stop it from collapsing meant progress was slow, especially at the south end, where the sand was softest. The tunnels were designed to be excavated simultaneously from both ends. We designed it so that the material at the south portal, the worst material, was able to be worked far slower. And therefore, the majority of the excavation was carried out from the north portal. Here we see the north portal works. This is the southbound tunnel where the machine's working at the moment, where we've started tunnelling a couple of days ago. Initially, we start with a little length because we've just started tunnelling, so it's a precautionary measure until we've got certainty of the ground, the processes, so we take small steps, and eventually we'll be going in two metre advances. We can't go too far, otherwise the ground becomes unstable and we could have a collapse, so there is a limit to how far we can go. Is it a straight tunnel? No. But before we can do all the building, what do you have to do first? You've got to design it. With so much activity on their doorsteps, not surprisingly, the local community took a keen interest, with schools becoming closely involved. Local schools were very keen to be involved in the project because it's a great opportunity for the children to see a construction site. Site visits started at the visitors' centre and were made by over 1,700 people over the four years of the project. Carefully. Construction sites had a history of just going in completing what they had to do without worrying about the impact on the local community. It's realised now that obviously you do need to link in with them because every construction has some form of impact. They get an insight on engineering, an insight on what's happening in their area. They will tell you that it's 371 million, you've rescued so many adders, you've erected so many dormice bridges. They're seeing history made. Seeing their little faces light up when they see a machine which is the same size as the building that they're taught in is worth 10 lessons. Little did visitors to the site realise that the high vantage point they were viewing from was to be excavated right down to the same level as the tunnel to become part of the new A3. Meanwhile underground, the excavation was inching its way through the sandstone. The tunnels were constructed by excavating in heading and bench, as we describe it. You dig out the top half of the tunnel known as a heading, and you excavate between one and one and a half metres at a time. So we've just currently dug out the top heading. We'll come back and dig out the bench. And the advantage with that technique is that you can slow or speed up according to ground conditions. It changes as we progress through the tunnel, which is why we have a team of geologists to check each face and determine our advance lengths as we go through. As fresh air flowed into the tunnel, excavated sandstone was taken out by conveyors. Remarkably, all the sand from here and the cuttings outside was kept within the site, with none being transported away on existing roads. We were very keen, both Highways Agency and Belfort Beatty, not to uh, take material off site. Fortunately, the 
north end of the scheme on the approaches to the north port of the tunnel, there is scope to put a lot of material and adjust levels according to how much material we've got. We built quite large embankments and screening buns along the bottom of the hill and then we've left material to one side of the scheme where we then level it out and recontour it to fit into the hillside. Construction work went on all day and when it wasn't near houses that would have been disturbed during the night. But not everything went exactly to plan. There's been lots of challenges along the way. Significant in this area has been the weather. It rains a lot in Hindhead. It seems to have its own ecosystem. So managing the water has been, been a big challenge. And dealing with that rain when the new roads and tunnel are complete was also part of the design. Because there aren't many streams in the area, most of the drainage has to go into soakaway balancing ponds. This is the soakaway. It's a 14 metre diameter and six and a half metre deep. Everything will end up into the ground. Yeah, some. 15 meter long wicks that will just allow the, um, the water to just soak away. As construction progressed, new road layouts began to take shape, but all the while the old A3 had to be kept running. We are just about to open southbound carriageway for traffic. At the moment, we are just about to finish all our work. All the work that we've had to do cannot impact on a very busy major artery for traffic running right through the middle of the scheme, which we have to keep open. So we had to move the road from one side to another rather than having to have a, a road closure, which would not be popular on this particular road. Then in February 2009 came the biggest milestone so far. Welcome to this impressive site to witness what is a, uh, a tremendous uh, milestone in terms of the development of this important road. It's the excitement of breaking through, getting the main civils part of the work over and be seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. Hearing this machine smashing away from the other side, ready to come through, and then coming through looking like some sort of a thing out of Doctor Who, just the lever waving around. You know, there's something really odd here as it's down here. You start to feel the breeze. I mean, you can feel the breeze flowing through, so we've actually got the air running back through right the way down. So it just, it just it's, for, it's for real. It's, it's, it's marvellous. This is just reward, really, for all that hard effort. Uh, and to actually see it break through uh, and to see it on the right alignment, I have to say, is, uh, is reassuring. There's a heck of a lot of work left to do, but this is, if you like, the exciting stage. Now it's the hard grind. That hard grind would take another two and a half years. Now it was possible to travel through the tunnel, earth removed to make cuttings in the south could be hauled through to make embankments in the north. Back inside, over the spray concreted support structure, was sprayed a waterproof membrane, finished off with a cast concrete secondary lining after which the sophisticated communications and operational equipment and road foundations could be added. The project won an international tunnelling award. That was for its use of the sprayed waterproofing system. And so much spray concrete and the sprayed waterproofing is a big achievement, a big innovation. What we're standing on right now is part of the secondary lining. To my right here we have the uh, concrete verge works. Inside the verges houses all the ducts in from where the, uh, all the power cables and communications are going to be run through. Right now we're actually standing within the road itself. If I stand here when it was finished, my head would be just about curb level right now. The final major landmark to be installed was the Miss James footbridge. This unique structure connects National Trust land on both sides of the road for equestrians and pedestrians. It spans a 25 metre wide cutting and was designed to frame the tunnel entrance for motorists travelling north. Miss James Bridge is named after a walk that uh, ran through that piece of land. She was a great benefactor to the National Trust and gave a lot of land to the National Trust. Miss James Footbridge was a big highlight for me. It was a great day seeing the four huge precast legs going in with two very large cranes lifting each leg in one at a time. And that... Every single leg is unique. It was a slightly different length, slightly different shape. Then parapets put on and, and finishing details, culminating with uh, the children planting the shrubs and bushes that live on the bridge. 
It was two years between construction and being open to people on foot as a green bridge. And in that time, the construction site was transformed, with the surrounding area being greened and landscaped. The aspect, the environmental, is sustainability, which is a very big thing in construction now. We did have to cut a lot of trees down to get, get through. We have planted more than we've cut down on the project. With the greening up of the slopes, it's starting to blend in and looks quite natural now. Some places were actually restoring heathland, so for instance around the existing A3 corridor. We built up earth buns to screen people from views of the road and also lots of noise fences along the south end of the scheme to control the noise levels. At where we've got steepened cutting slopes, we've put in what look like hexagonal boxes on the sides of the slope and then filled those with soil and they hold the soil in place so we're able to plant on those as well. And of course all you see is a grass face and you just have no idea what's going on behind it. <laughs> Inside the tunnel, the drainage system, which was rigorously tested before the tunnel opened, is environmentally controlled. If the water coming out of the tunnel and off the road network is found to be clean, it's passed to the balancing ponds and into the local watercourses. If any pollutants are detected in the water, our active diverter system closes a valve which prevents the water from entering the watercourses and it's instead transferred into our impounding sump where it will be contained until it can be pumped away. One of the special events for me is had a walkthrough where we opened the tunnel, the whole tunnel, to the general public for uh, Saturday, the 14th of May. 17,000 people applied to uh, walk through the tunnel, and uh, we only had room for 7,000. It was one of those sort of real good community days. Everybody wandering through the tunnel, and they were having their photographs taken at the deepest point, and the breakthrough point under the existing A3, enjoyed by everybody. One of the things that people noticed is the tunnel isn't straight. In fact, there's quite a bend. The route of the tunnel was selected to keep within the best tunnelling strata and also that we had to put a curve in the alignment to follow the Devil's Punch Bowl contours. If the tunnel route had been straight, we would have had a small section of road which was visible through the punch bowl. The design of the tunnel also incorporated the most sophisticated and advanced control and safety systems. There are very many innovations at Hindhead with the equipment that's being installed in the tunnel. For example, the tunnel incident detection system uses radar for the first time on the UK road network. If we have objects which are out of the ordinary in the road, it would close that lane of the tunnel, it would impose a speed limit, it would flash up on all the signs, it would swing all the cameras round to have a look at that area in detail. The tunnels are packed full of equipment. We've got CCTV, jet fans to regulate the, the flow of air in the tunnels. All of these systems had to be monitored by the, uh, by the operators. We've got control rooms at both ends. The, one of the control rooms is permanently manned 24-7. It's a lot more than just two holes in the ground. You know, there is a whole system looking after that with people controlling the systems. With the opening approaching, the control and safety systems were tested by an emergency exercise. Having the, the longest land tunnel in the country located on our police area is going to be a new experience for us. It's a new challenge. It's replacing a bit of road at the Devil's Punch Bowl that has been synonymous with a number of serious and fatal accidents and hopefully it'll actually improve road safety from that point of view. The tunnel's been designed with a number of safety features. It has a ventilation system that allows us to create an area of relative safety. There's a fire main that runs the whole length of the 1.8 kilometres, so we've got an instant attack to deal with any fire incident. There's also the communications that you've got at the cross passageways, the PA system, that all can be used to our advantage. With everything tested and everything working, on July the 27th, 2011, Transport Secretary Philip Hammond opened the tunnel. It's been built and it's opening. There are lots of big achievements that have gone along the way, have all come together to, to make this road. It's such a huge achievement, fabulous transformation for the area. That 
Transformation is being completed by restoring the old A3 to Heathland and by improving the local roads to kick-start the rejuvenation of Hindhead Village. But for the tunnel construction itself, the story is complete. You sit there and look at models, look at plans and try and imagine it, and it's good to see that it really does look as good as what you hoped it would. The, the stereotype is that projects run over, costing more money and, and not opening on time. This is on time, it's under budget. It gives me quite a buzz to think that we're proving the life of the people who live in Hindsay, but also the travelling public, travelling all up or down the A3 on a daily basis. You've now got a more reliable, faster journey. I'm very proud to be part of this project. It's been the major part of my life for the last eight years, and it's great to see the project coming through to fruition. And it's a great relief, I think, to a lot of people, and, and pleasure. They're going to find themselves getting to work a lot earlier to start with. <laughs>